<laughs> All right. So the cool part, um, you guys noticed that we're kind of doing this a little bit differently. So we're going to use SlideShare. Um, one of the things that people have kind of told me is that they don't have access to a PowerPoint reader. So everything's through SlideShare. So you can just go and bring that up. The cool part is that when I'm done recording the video, I actually can link the video at the end of the slide presentation. So you can watch the video as we kind of go through it. And you're all on one screen. So um, the link is in your course shell for you. So we're going to start working on script two. And that means you're going to understand case and this handy little program called tput. tput is awesome. It will not break your computer. It will solve everything. It will solve all your problems and make good coffee. tput is awesome. Just so you know. <coughs> All right. So before case comes read. So before you do anything, case relies on user input. In other words, I have to be able to type something in so I know what to do with it. Usually case is like I've, if A, B, C, D, E, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're expecting a certain input. The one thing you always want to make sure, though, when you're doing this is that what happens if I just hit some random key? So you want to have an input for one. Oh, wait. That we don't recognize that. So go away. You're bugging me. The accepted inputs are. Right? So when you're working with a case, you want to read. So read is your statement, and then choice, and then you turn that read into a variable by putting the dollar sign in front of it. All right, so if I say read choice, and then I say CD to choice, if I say, well, home bin Dan, then it will automatically change directory over to home bin Dan. So it basically reads the input from the keyboard and then changes the directory over. Yes, sir? Well, this is just kind of a demo model to kind of tell you how read works, so we're, there's no error correction in this. This is just to get you over the idea that I can read something in and throw it out as a variable. We'll go over that next, though. All right? So you can do this anywhere in a script for just about anything you can do on a Linux box. So you could actually read the user processes for a specified user, for root or for someone else, and then go ahead and pull all of those out by just grabbing for, the, for that username. So if you wanted to find out how many processes Dan had running, you could just type in my name for all the processes that I started and fired off. So this is really good for troubleshooting. In case you, your user is using up a whole bunch of stuff, you can just keep tabs on their user processes to see what they're firing off and causing their systems to slow down. All right. Now, case with default entries, right? And this is what will make most programmers absolutely insane, right? So default, we're already going ahead and saying that my entry is Kiwi, right? We're not giving the user anything. If we just poke this up, it would just pop off that New Zealand is an awesome place to live, right? So there's really no point in having case fruit in if it says apple or banana. There's no reason for this because we already say fruit is equal to Kiwi. So we'll just copy over New Zealand is famous for Kiwi, right? We'll get there. You're jumping ahead, which is cool. You're thinking, right? Which is awesome. Well, I want to clarify it. Can you link those together? Hold on. We'll get there. Give me a minute, guys. We're just getting started. So I'm kind of I'm introducing this slowly. Slow. Slow and stable, right? So, but this is a full blown case statement. It actually works, right? The only problem is that we already know the fruit's key. We already know what the answer is going to be all the time. So you really can't do anything horrible with it, and then it escapes. And then we're done. So we'll just keep there. Every time you run it, we'll just say New Zealand's awesome. Yes? Yep. Yep. You'll never see what the, what the answer for apple or banana is, so why did you even bother coding it? All right? So in this program, we see fruit is set to Kiwi. Case statement reads it, and then it says New Zealand's famous for. Right? If we wanted to change this so the user input was considered, we could say read fruit. So instead of fruit equal kiwi, we just say read fruit, right? And then echo allowed, uh, they put in something like cassava melon, right? We could say anything else would be allowed entries are apple, banana, and kiwi. Remember case sensitivity. So if you typed in capital K-I-W-I, it still would see that as invalid, right? So read is really truly important for bringing in that user statement and letting them do something on the keyboard. Although sometimes you don't want to allow users on the keyboard, you just really kind of want to lockstep them through it. <laughs> continue. Now, continue is kind of interesting. Everybody remember what the double bars mean? It's <laughs> out of here. It's a logical or, right? Choice A or continue, right? So if they hit choice A, if we read in choice A or continue, 
right? It's the same thing as this, right? So we can either shorthand it or we can longhand it. It's really easy, all right? So it's up to you on this one. But basically, the continue statement restarts the execution of the loop, which is really important in a case statement. Because case is going to tell us to go somewhere, but then sometimes we want to return back to the original menu. Right? So continue is going to give us and put us right back into that looping case statement. So once I've done that, and we've done all the things we need to do there, and we have another really interesting loud, loud <laughs> ringer. It's almost as bad as mine. All right? That we can return them back to that statement. So we've got it. Yes, ma'am. A or continue. Yeah, it can be either or. Is there a, is there a, um, a quotation mark missing there? No. Just a single quote? Yeah. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, it just basically that. sets it up as a variable. Right? Because again, we want the variable. Remember, continue returns us back. All right, now T put. It will not crash your computer, it will make your computer do really cool things. So way back in the day, way back in the day of Sega, Sega Genesis, <laughs> right? We always wanted to be able to put cursors exactly where we wanted them to be on the screen, right? So we would track X, Y movement. And that's basically what T-Put is. It allows you to specify a specific place on the screen where to put your cursor, where to put your entry point, right? So you could say column two, position, <laughs> row zero, right? And that's going to put it right up in the middle of the top left-hand side of the screen. Because remember, computers read left to right. Right, because we're English. If you actually go and you take a look at some other countries' computers, the interesting part though is Chinese computers read, damn, kills me. Wow. Do you know how hard it is for an American to go use a Chinese computer? That's entertainment. Wow. It took me like five minutes to figure out just the file structure because it's all in Chinese and I was praying to God that what was similar in American Microsoft would be similar to Chinese Microsoft and I was lucky, really lucky, <laughs> right? So basically TPUT allows you to what's called the term info database, right? The terminal info, the information about your TTY, your standard out, is your screen, makes it rows and columns, right? It's usually default 80 for columns, so I have 80 characters across the screen. You can also change that over to 132 column screen, so you get a little bit more density on it. And then the rows are pretty much so set at 40, all right? So you can have low density or high density, 80, 132, and then 40 columns down. Right, but that's basically what term info database is. It keeps track of where everything is on the screen. It's so kind of an interesting way of doing it. Now then you can go manipulate what's on that screen by using tput. So kind of cool. All right. So in action. So this is actually a line from broken script. The one you're going to be working on. Case r count in tput cup two zero. So column row. So in column two, row zero, I want you to echo the letter L and period, and then I want you to return. That's exactly what that says. Okay, right? So where's cup coming? All right. Cup is the cursor position. C U for cursor. P is position. And so it has the, the syntax is the syntax is T put, cursor position, cup, column two, row zero. Semicolon echo out lowercase l dot. So the things that will be changing will be the numbers. Mm-hmm. Yep. So and then we have an interval of the amount of time I want person to actually see that before I go do something else with it. And then we return. So our count, if our count is equal to one, then here throw out an L on the screen in this position. Right? So case using the variable R count, position the cursor on the screen and coordinates X, Y, and then echo out the letter L and then sleep for whatever the interval is set at. <clears throat> Make sense? Huh? Cursor, C U. Oh, C U is for cursor. Yeah, and then P is for position. Okay. Yep. Because we can remember cup a lot easier than cursor position. That's column two, row zero. Yep. So you can dump this mid screen by using column forty, row twenty. And it would put it right in the middle of the screen. All right. Now, the cool part is you can also do colors. I like colors. You can set foreground and background colors, so you can make it fancy, right? And fancy is good. 
So when you do this, your color set is basically a seven color spectrum, basically standard black, blue, green. So you could do black on black, set your foreground and background colors to black, and you will never see what's happening on the screen. If you're, if you're colorblind, people are gonna really hate you really fast. White, white on white, green on red. <laughs> you can really mess with people. Red and magenta are really good together because no one can, it's really hard to tell the difference apart because magenta is a little bit pink, but red on a standard CRT is really bright and, and vibrant where magenta is kind of weak and lame. So you can really screw with people's heads by setting foreground and setting background colors. Right? So colors are actually kind of fun because it can also help you highlight what's critical information on the screen. All right? All right? So if I put, here's my regular teacup put, or T put cup, position two, echo, LO. I can also set the foreground, set F, to color four. And if I set the foreground to color four, I'm setting that to red. So the foreground, the actual letter itself, will be red, right? Now, if we do set B, background color, if we did set B four, so red on red, good color combination, just to annoy people, right? Then we can go ahead and do that. So it would so it would just see a big red block on the screen, and they wouldn't see anything else. All right. So you kind of have to play around with colors. You have to be careful with it. And again, this is bad for people who are colorblind or not using standard terminal coloring. Right. So if you go and you change standard terminal coloring, you can actually really mess with someone's day because those will be interpreted against standard terminal, but will render really different based on non-standard terminal colors. So it's fun to play around with, and you can get kind of creative with this. So you would put set you would put T put set F four set B four two zero comma echo E L O B and C. Right, and it doesn't matter. It can be set F set B or set B set F. It will just read them and then render those colors accordingly. All right. So putting in an interval. So this is one of the th one of the portions of that script that's in your angel. The interval is set to one thousand. Right. And remember your interval counts by seconds. But when you're using time as a variable, you have to tell it. So if you want that to be 1,000 seconds, it has to be 1,000 S. If you want it to be 1,000 minutes, it would be 1,000 M. If you want it, it, it will default to seconds. It will default to seconds. If you say 1,000 D, that's 1,000 days. I ain't hanging around for three and a half years waiting for this thing to happen, right? I'm gonna be honest, right? So our count is set initially to zero. For each R count, the line rotates one eighth of a cycle, right? And you can kind of see that rotation L, L O, right? And, and the script that spells out loading, but it's all one one color. It's kind of boring. It's visually unappealing, right? So while loop forever until this function is killed, our count is then equal to R count dot one. And while it reads case one, right? So zero has no entry. One thing is gives you an L, then two. And then when it hits seven, it resets itself and goes back. You'll see the, the or continue. What's the flash B flash B? It's a return. Oh, okay. It's a return okay. character. Okay. Okay. You could also do slash N for return. Okay. The, the space on a computer. Preference. User preference. All right. So that's basically what your script is about, is going to be repairing this thing. Right now, the cool part is if we go and we actually take a look at broken script. So this is your script, right? So it was originally written as part of the book, and then modified by me and a student. And then the last time it was written was 2011, so it's a little dated and old on top of it, right? So parsing and timing a log file in a Linux environment. So usual standard kind of we clear the screen when starting, and then what this ends up happening is it reads what and where we want files to be read, right? So choose the file you want to parse from which directory. And it echoes, this is your current working directory, so it will then pop a PWD, so the user knows where they are, right? And then you need to type in a full path, example home files for this class or wherever your actual place exists. And then it reads the choice or continues, right? <coughs> and then it changes the directory over to choice and does an ls minus la, and then choose the files to parse. And then it comes up with choice A. Yes. In that ls-la, mm -hmm. if you have a huge portion, is there a way to break that out? I mean, like if you have like a bunch of files. 
it will just cough out the whole screen. So it doesn't page it. And so is there a way to, I guess you would just throw that in the LS and then LA mm -hmm. instead of the type form. Yep. LS, LS, and then by page or by column. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can change that format of LSLA and make it a little bit more handy. Hit people so they can hit the space bar to bring up another row of stuff. Right? So read choice A, which is really bad because we have choice and then choice A. So it kind of confuses people off the board to pull the file. And then it sleeps. So you choose a file to parse, right? And then it sleeps for a thousand seconds. All right? So it just kind of hangs out for a thousand seconds and goes doo doo doo. Right? And then shows you where your current working directory is again. All right, and then asks you where do you want to save this file, right? And it reads choice A again. So we have choice A being called for the file I want to parse and choice A being called for the directory I want to write to, which is generally a bad thing when you have this two different objects with the same variable name. So you're going to want to fix that. So would you just put choice B? I would think that you would want to go in with a whole fresh naming convention on this one because choice is really ambigu am ambiguous. Yeah. So I would say, Home directory, write directory, filed parse. You know, make it really easy for the person that's coming along and reading it after you. Yes, sir. You could do everything, yeah, yeah, no. If if you want efficient versus elegant, right? There's kind of a trade-off between the two. Efficient is what works in a minimal amount of time and gives the user the satisfaction of running your script, right? Then there's elegant, which is a beautiful way of solving the problem, but may not necessarily be the most efficient, right? right? Given that these are broken scripts, you have complete freedom to rewrite them however you think they should be done, okay, so right? So some people are going to just hand me back a script with minor mods they'll meet the bare minimum of what this thing is supposed to do. Other people will completely rewrite it and make it both elegant and super efficient and go completely off the page, right? And those will be graded according to that particular standard. All right. It's to make it better if you've got the time, okay. right? Because some people are going to struggle just with this, and I'm good with that. But other people are going to go, oh, okay, let me do something really, really cool and fun with it and then go play with it, right? Because when people tell me they're bored, I just tend to throw them more stuff to go do, right? Yes, ma'am. Because some of us don't know, mm -hmm. we're learning now, and so we, we're not at a level where we can um, produce something elegant mm -hmm. and sophisticated. Yeah, exactly, and I take that into account. No, it won't. It won't. No, it won't. If you do the minimum, you'll get the grade. If you do more than that, then you get like the super extra grade, and I'll bring you donuts. Okay. Right. And I've been known to bring donuts. Right. So, basically, then back to where we were. We sleep a thousand. We sleep a hundred seconds. So that's kind of long for a person, right? It's a minute and a half. Basically, a little over that. Where do you want to save your file? And again, we have choice A being called for multiple times. And then, what would you like to parse from the file? And then read grep continue, right? The grep statement is just a grep statement. It doesn't really do anything special, right? But it then gives you a uh, chance to continue if I want to bail out of this. I can go back to the beginning of the loop. So that's why the pipe continue is so important. Because if I screw up, then I can go right back to the start. It takes me right back to the beginning of this thing, right? Or it runs the process, either or. So it kind of gives me a bailout clause. Right? And then this is where we can tell <coughs> the user that we're actually doing something interesting. So we make our function rotate. Right? So we set our interval to 1,000, sleep time between rotation intervals that will default to a second. Right? 1,000 seconds is a lot of time. That's a seriously stupid amount of time. Right? No question asked. Right? R count zero. For each R count, the line rotates one eighth of a cycle, while loop forever until this function is killed. Right? So do R count, where R count equals plus one. This we increment it so I can get different output back to the screen. And again, this is where we get into the T, the T put cup, where for every interval, it gives you an L, an O, LOA, load, loading, 
and all the way through this up till seven when you get the full loading line that sleeps, then it resets our count back to zero. So we go back and it will sit there and do this forever and ever and ever until the computer gets powered off or you control C out of it, right? And this is kind of an interesting way to use case to manage output for a specific timing feedback for the user, right? <coughs> and then once that's done, it bails out, right? End of function. And then files being input into the script, there's where you're reading in file choice three, choice two, choice one out, right? So choice three, two, one don't correspond with choice A or choice or choice B. We don't even have a choice B, right? So this whole thing is a, just a disaster. It doesn't match anywhere on the inputs that we're asking from the user, right? So you're going to want to harmonize the inputs we're asking from the user to whatever we put here on our parse the script from. And then the script you just got done working on, right? Out file, grep, grep, bat, cat, in file. Well, we're not even pulling that user input for what I want to grep for. We've got them locked into something. So we have to actually put the user input into that grep statement so we know what we're looking for. All right? And then time and parse. You guys are actually really familiar with this one because you just got done fixing it. So you're going to make the same changes here, except for we have rotate unicorn, right? So start the visual rotating, rotate and. So we got to make sure we're calling the rotate function right, right? Because we don't really have a rotate unicorn. We just have a rotate function. And then it does that whole A, X, parser, date, time, difference, parser, parser file. Here's what's interesting though. Kill minus 19. What is kill minus 19? Kill minus 19 doesn't even exist, right? So kill minus nine is kind of a, a way of doing it. So that's what gets you out of that rotate loop. He's actually manually going in and killing the process. So is there a better way to do this or do we just hard reset that process in the script, right? And then echo everything you've got, sleep one second, echo, have a pleasant day, and then it sleeps some more. The other cool part about this too is that if I'm running a really, really long script, and I don't want to wait for it. Down here at the bottom is an auto mailing function that will use the mail server inside your Linux to actually mail you an email saying that, hey, I'm all done, right? So that makes it even more. You can just run it in the background and walk away and go do other stuff and say it runs overnight, right? Because of the huge file that you're parsing stuff out of. You can just let the thing run and do its own thing and it will just drop you an email when it's all done so you know when to go look at it too, right? So you can have visual or you can have an alert system on top of it. So you want to make sure that your mail script can actually work with your Linux box. So hopefully everybody remembers how to configure SendMail. All right? You may have to do that to make sure this thing works. Maybe. Or leave it commented out. All right? This one's optional. Because people were asking me for a little bit more complexity in the scripts after last week. So there's tons of fun stuff you can do in here. You have colors. You have rotating dancing bears that you can put in here. You have email services for alerting and warning. You have a lot of cool stuff you can do in here. All for parsing a file. And when does this one do? This one is due April 19th. Okay, right? All right. So the other thing that you're going to want to know is that we're not going to work with superheroes.txt. I actually pulled some access logs out of my web server. So the access logs are things. There's about five megs worth of access logs here, really innocuous kind of stuff. So you could actually tell me, do I want to search for what pages were popular? Do I want to search for error codes? Anything that's 500, 501, 502? Do I want to search for success code 200? So there's all sorts of things you can do with this, but this is your data path, the access logs. So this is what you want to parse. So it's really kind of neat. Again, they're just regular old access logs. It's not a big, big kind of deal. Right? They're a little old, but it's basically your standard Apache log. Right? So there's nothing special in here you guys haven't seen because I kept on asking you to look at your logs last term, right? So you've seen your Apache logs? So you know it's IP address, date, time, where they went to, Google bot. You know, you can tell me you could do we could do a search for Google.com and tell me how many times Google hit my web server. Which would be interesting because Google spends more time on my web server than I do. Right? Um, Zamata is an aggregator. You know, Beidou is the Chinese search engine spider. 
which is really kind of cool. I'm not banned in China yet, right? And that clears my object. So it's using Mozilla as Firefox. So we can parse this file for just about anything that we're looking for. You can actually give me examples or things to go look for if I don't know what's in here. So you could say, look for user agent. And you could say, okay, these are all the Firefox people that came through, right? And if you really want to go super expressive, for those of you who told me you're bored already, why don't you give me a count of how many times Firefox came through, and Internet Explorer, and Safari, and Opera, and all the other web browsers, right? So there's ways of doing this. Lots of cool stuff in here. You know, I actually find some people trying to hack me in here too. That's the reason why I pulled them down. <laughs> so there's some hacking activity in here that you could tell me about too. Yes, sir. I'm very vis visual. Uh huh. My it's just a good guess. Mm hmm. Uh, do you have the working program for this particular? Yes, I do. No, I'm not going to give you the working program because then that, that will lead to cheating. You know what I'm saying is if you could run it so that we can see more or less what the... I could do that. I, that I can do. I'm really useful. I want yeah. to see what... Yeah, no, we'll do that on Friday. We'll, sh we'll bring up the script and let you have it. Yes, sir. Is Teacup something you have to download and install? Nope, it's already part of your, it's already part of your Linux install. Okay. So there's no extra software that you have to install or download. That comes with every Linux system? It comes with every Linux system. Oh. Every single honking one of them. Okay. All right. Any other questions? You guys excited about this one? Yeah. You sure? Hamsters? Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. So you guys have got this. You guys have got the, the slides. So you guys can pull through this. When I upload this, the, the video will follow the slides. Yes, sir. Is this due next Friday? This is due April 19th. That's 19th? Na next Friday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Number one is due next this Friday, yeah. <laughs> yep. But again, right, if you just go real simple and easy, or if you're bored, go real super fancy, there's a lot of play in this script that you guys can actually do stuff, right? But the initial repairs to this script for what you want to look for are actually really simple. And you've already done the majority of them. You've done the time. You've done what file, how to parse a file using grep. So you've done half of it already. So you already know what to fix. The only thing that's going to be interesting is how do you do the user input for what file do I want to parse? And then what do I really want to look for? Right. So that's where the initial challenge is going to be. Yes, sir. Say you already turned in the first script with the production stuff. Uh-huh. I will take a look at anything that was submitted first on Friday and then work my way backwards. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. So if you submit something on Friday, I won't worry about whatever you submitted on Wednesday. Sounds awesome. Thank yep. you very much. Yes, sir. Yeah, bring it up and I'll take a look at it today. So beta version views, yeah, we're good to go. All right, so any other questions? Are we good? Are you happy? Is this awesome or what? Yeah. All right. So remember, if you guys are really struggling, right, you've already done half the script. You already know how to do the timing. You already know how to do the grab statement. And you already know how to fix some of the other stuff. The new stuff that's being put in here, the rotate and t, and t put cup, and then the user input so we can select which file and which directory we want to pull. All right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then it will not work. I want bin sh. I want, I, I want bin sh for maximum portability across systems. Yep. If you're running your script from the command line and you need dash space minus xd for the debugger, mm -hmm. why does that work? There's bunches of different terminals in there. Bash and, and SH are similar across all terminals, but SH is more common than Bash. Linux, when you're especially the Ubuntu version that we're dealing with, has got Bash, Corn, and all the other cell shit. 
Mm-hmm. It'll still run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. But I want maximum portability, so your command's going to be bin sh. All right. What you got? All right. Well, let me finish up here. Any other questions about today's exercise? All right. You guys are good then. I'll go ahead and post this up, and we're set.